I'd like to introduce a group of children's games. These are intended for teaching children, young children, who don't know anything about music, or about computers, all about music and a bit about computers. Now, there are a bunch of games here, four games all together, and we'll start off by looking at the first one. But before we start, I'd like to just mention the way in which the games are organized. Think, if you will, of Alice in Wonderland. Now, Alice wanders around looking at things in her world, in her pretty unusual world it is, too. Then she's wandering around and she sees a, a little biscuit on the ground labelled, Eat Me. She nibbles it, and lo and behold, all of a sudden finds herself shrinking. And as she shrinks, the world expands around her, and then she sees it from a completely different perspective. Now, that's the kind of thing that you'll be seeing in these games. And of course, as well as shrinking, if you remember in Alice in Wonderland, there was a bottle there labelled Drink Me, and when she went and drank the, uh, the liquid in the bottle, then she expanded then to her old size, and then the world looked the same as it had. Now, we're going to be travelling around this world now, uh, called Music Land, and have a look at music from different points of view. So, to start off with, let's have a look at what we see on the computer screen. Now, before, before we start to play, let me explain how the, uh, how the game works. Now, over here, you see something that looks like an, an ice hockey puck with some buttons on it. And here, on the plastic uh, hockey rink, you'll see that if I move this around on the, on the rink, that on the screen, that little crosshairs whizzes around as I move. You watch. So I'm moving in a circle, moving my hand in a circle over here, moving the puck in a circle, and as I move the puck in a circle, the plus sign moves in a circle on the screen. Now watch happen what happens when I push the magic yellow button. I'll push the magic yellow button, and you'll see that a question mark appears on the screen. Now, this magic yellow button is used to signal to the computer that I want to do something. Now, for example, the first thing that I want to do is to get the computer to play me a piece of music. Now, to do that, we move down on the screen to the very bottom of the screen, where you see one, two, three, four, five little boxes. Inside each box is some music. Now, to hear the music that's inside the box, we move the little plus sign until it's over the word play and push the magic yellow button. And you hear that the star of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was played. Now, to hear what's in other boxes, we can point underneath them too. So let's, let's pick this, this one here, all right? Notice that the pattern inside the box matches the shape of the music. For example, the last one went boing, boing, and you can see that the notes, one note is higher than the other on the picture. Similarly, at the start of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star starts by going up and then back down again. And you can see that the shape of the music is reflected by the shape in the picture there. Now, let's, let's have some action now. To play this game, what we do is we point to these boxes down here, and the goal of the game is to make a well-known tune. Now, you know and I know that the tune is, in fact, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But for a child that is starting to play this game without knowing that, the child has to guess what the tune is. So let's start to play. First of all, we point to the box and push the magic yellow button, and it floats up to the tops. Let's do the same to the next box. In fact, let's not be terribly original. Let's do it to all those boxes. Now, what's happened is that we've got a group of five boxes up here, and now, in order to hear what they all sound like played one after the other, we'll go over to the word play and push the magic yellow button. And now,
Now, in order to make Twinkle Twinkle Little Star out of that, we have to do a bit of shifting around. So, first of all, let's, let's get rid of this box here because we don't really need him. So to do that, all I do is I push the magic yellow button and now I'll just shake the cursor and what did you notice? But it disappeared. Let me do the same thing over here to this one. I'll shake it off the cursor and it disappears. Now, that's rather fun. Um, supposing that we are playing this game and of course the idea of the game is that you explore while you play. Supposing I hadn't really meant to throw that last one away, then I can come over to the side of the screen and you'll notice that there are a number of words displayed here. The top one says restart, then there's one labelled undo. Then there's play, which causes what's displayed out there to be played. Save allows you to keep it. And, well, these magic buttons we're going to find out in a, about in a moment. So let's just point to undo and push the magic yellow button and you'll see that the last box that we threw away has in fact appeared. Now, let's, let's bring a few more boxes up there. You'll see one of the things we'll want to do now is to move these around. So let's point to this box here and give it a shove to the right. So we'll give it a shove to the right and you'll notice that they all move along. Now supposing I want to pick this box up and move it around to the end. Well, just as I did it there, let me do it over here. Pick it up and move it around to the end there and it floats nicely into place. Uh, similarly, if I want to, uh, if I want to uh, get rid of this, another way of getting rid of it is to push it off the edge of the screen and it disappears. So uh, you can see that by playing with this tune, we can, playing with these boxes, we can put together a tune. Now, notice that just as we could hit undo when we, when we did something we didn't really mean to, we can actually save the tune at any point. If we're worried about losing it, we can just save it. And by pointing to the save button here. Now, if you watch the screen very carefully, you'll notice that when I push the save button, another magic button will appear underneath it. That restore button brings me back this music if at any stage I get rid of it. So why don't I throw some of these away and you'll see me restore what I threw away. Let's throw away those two middle boxes there and now I'll restore, push the restore button and you'll see like magic here it all is again. Now uh, notice that this encourages me to play because I can always get back to what I had a moment ago. Now let me just well, we can play the music that's up there. It doesn't sound terribly exciting because uh, if we had an expert here, a seven-year-old expert, I'm sure it would have sounded a lot more like Twinkle Twinkle. Notice how the shape of the notation matches the shape of the music. Now, after playing with this game for a while, once we've got the hang of it and we've made our tune, then obviously it would be nice to go to another tune. Now, here is another bunch of boxes. If we point to this one now, we'll hear that we've got a completely different tune. Let's play the second box and see what tune we've got here. That sounds a pretty strange sort of tune. Uh, well now, uh, what I'd like to do now is to bring one of our little experts in to show how she plays with this game, and let's see how, what fun she has.
this game of music boxes, the child can explore many different tunes. Now, you've just, uh, we've just explored Twinkle Twinkle, and we can now go to the next tune by pushing the next tune button and having a look at Pop Goes the Weasel. And in this tune, we can put together tune any way we want it. Let's listen to what we've got. Now, uh, what we can do now is we can go now and imagine that we're Alice in Wonderland and we're going to look inside, we're going to nibble one of these biscuits and shrink down and see the world from an entirely different viewpoint. So to do that, we now point to the box that we're going to redefine. So let's, let's point to this box here. And you'll see that it gradually expands to fill the entire screen. And now we're into the next game called Music Doodles. Now, as you can see, here we are with our tune displayed on the screen. Only now we're in a different game. You'll see that there are words around the screen, and those words allow us to control what happens. Now, let me just explain about something new that we can do here. Uh, one of the things that we can do is we can, if we, with this cursor, we can push the magic yellow button on top of one of those words there, and we get a quill. You can see a quill displayed on the screen. Now, when I push the magic yellow button, if we watch the quill on the screen, you'll see that it draws a shape. And it matches the shape that I'm drawing over here. Now, let's say that I, I want to... Now, what I've done is I've drawn a circle, and I've drawn two little circles around there to show that I want just those notes there and not those ones there. Now, notice that on the screen, the notes that I have specified now float and move around. If I move the puck in my right hand in a circle, you'll see that the notes on the screen also move in a circle. Now, those notes are effectively floating around, and if I want to hear what they sound like up there, I can push a button on the cursor puck, this blue button here, and it will play the music at the new location on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push them off the edge of the picture and you'll see that th we've got rid of them. So now let's point to the word transform and now I'll pick up these notes here and we'll be able to move them around the screen. Now let's put them down up there on the music. To do that, I just push the magic yellow button. And there they go. Let me put them down here at the end. Now, what's rather fun to do is to, to change the shape of this. Now, to do that, what I do is I can stroke these sliders down here. Now, if I stroke, if I stroke this this gadget here, what it does is it shrinks the music on the screen in the time direction. So let's hear what it sounds like shrunk. Okay, and now what we can do is to, if we, we can expand it by stroking this the other way. Now let's see what happens when we stroke the slider a little bit further in the other direction. Notice how the music is shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking, and then like magic, it shrinks to nothing and comes out the other side of nothing back to front. Good heavens. So let's listen to what that sounds like back to front. Okay. Now, we can put that on the music anywhere we like. Why don't we put it just there? To do that, we just push the magic yellow button, and 
it sticks to the music. Now, just as we've been able to stretch it and squeeze it in the time domain, now we can do the same thing with the in the pitch domain. So now, as I stroke it, the music stretches up in the air. So let's, let's hear what it sounds like when it's stretched up in the air. And, and we can also, if we squish it back the other way, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks to nothing. And then when I keep shrinking it, it emerges out the other side of nothing, upside down. So now we've got our original tune upside down and back to front. And I think you'll agree that it's rather hard to recognize. So let's put it down on the music and we anchor it to the music by pushing the magic yellow button and there it is stuck to the music. Now at this point, this point let's stop playing with that little motif and listen to what we've done. To do that we, we point to the play command on the screen. So you can see that if we started off with ba 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 bom, the start of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, then we could in fact put together the rest of the symphony, at least the opening part, by circling those four notes and stretching them and squeezing them and putting them all over the music to make that start of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I wonder if he would have done it that way if he could. Now notice, notice that by using these sliders here, and using the uh, cursor puck over here, that we've been able to do some rather sophisticated musical things. In fact, with a single gesture, we've been able to learn several different musical transformations, which are normally taught at university level. Now, those transformations are stretching in this direction, which is called augmentation, squeezing, which is called diminution, and remember when we squeezed it past nothing and it came out back to front, that's called retrograde, and then when we took the pitches and squashed them and then they came out upside down, that was called inversion. So in a single stroke of the finger, we are able to perform transformations of musical material. And if you remember, by moving the puck around, we are able to transpose those musical ideas up and down on the music and hear them before we decide just where in the music we want them to go. Now I think that's a rather powerful toy. Now, just as in the boxers game we were able to throw something away just by shaking it off our puck, here we can do the same thing. So let me now draw a large circle around everything on the screen, because I'd like to show you something else in this game. And now I'll shake it off the puck, shake, 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 and it's all gone. Now at this point, you'll notice that there's a button on the screen labeled Draw. Now I will be able to do something rather unusual now. And don't forget, this is the same part of the game. Here I've now got a quill and I can draw a shape. Let me draw. Let me draw a sea monster. There's a sea monster. Now what the computer is going to do is play me music with the same shape as that picture that I've drawn. But before I do that, before the computer does that, what it's going to do, notice how it's unkinking all the curves that have gone to the left. Now the reason it's doing that is because music goes from left to right on the screen. And now Here's the shape of the back of our monster. And now it's going to play his chin. And now it's going to play its eye. 
And notice on the screen, there's a picture of a Buddha sitting between two loudspeakers. That Buddha, which you probably wondered about, indicates that we should be patient. And the loudspeakers tell us that the Buddha is being patient so that he's going to hear something. That was the smile that we just heard. Now we're going to see all the music displayed on the screen. There it goes. There's our sea monster. Now let's hear what that sea monster sounds like in its entirety. Wasn't that fun? Now, of course we can draw other shapes or we can transform them. So what I'd like to do now is to take his smile and, uh, and do something with it. So let's circle his smile. There we are. And now, let's put it on the screen. We'll make a little bit of a sea for him to swim around in. And now, let's get rid of his mouth, his smile. And let's pick up his, his eye. And why don't we turn his eye upside down. And let's put it down here as another fish in the bottom of the ocean. And let's give another fish to keep him company. Now let's hear what this fishy piece sounds like. I'll now point to play and we'll hear... Notice that on this color screen over here, there's our sea monster and the music that we have derived by transformation from his smile is displayed in yellow and the music that we've derived from his eye, remember we turned it upside down and turned it into little companion fishes, that appears orange. So you can see that on this color screen we've got an analysis, a thematic analysis of what we've just been composing, color coded by the source of the thematic material. Now, isn't that a handy way of learning analysis? Notice that by making a shape with my hand on the tablet here, that I'm creating music with the same shape, the same contour on the screen, just by gestures. Now, uh, at this point, you'll notice on the screen that there's another word called piano. Now, what I'd like to do is to introduce uh, the piano here, and you'll see what happens when we move to the keyboard. Notice that the music that Jeremy has just played is shown on the, on the screen in the same notation that he used before for painting and for inking. Now we're going to go to the next game which is called Termbra Painting where we can orchestrate the piece of Brahms that Jeremy has just played. Here we now see around the music some blocks underneath it which represent Termbra. 
Each of those blocks consists of two little pictures joined together. The bottom part of the picture tells us the way in which the loudness of the note varies with time. The top little picture tells us about the richness of the timbre by showing us the overtones that are present. Now, on a, the color screen, which is to the right of the uh, players, uh, you can see the notation. And instead of having the blocks representing timbre, we have paint pots. Each paint pot is a different color, and there are six of them all together. Notice how the position of the paint pot on the screen corresponds to one of those blocks of timbre on the green and white screen that we've just been watching. Now, to play this game, we dip a brush in one of these paint pots and paint the, pa the notes different colors, and then we'll hear them being orchestrated. Now Jeremy is going to paint the music now. First of all, he's going to dip the cursor, the little crosshairs, into the blue paint pot. Notice how he's now got a blue paint brush with which he can slap paint all over the music. Now he can slap paint over as much of the music as he likes and the computer will automatically clean up after him. Those notes that he brushes with the paint brush will then get orchestrated with a particular timbre and to hear it, we point to the loudspeaker in the top left-hand corner and put some paint on that. Now, to paint a different timbre on, we dip that blue paintbrush into another pot, in this case a purple pot, and Sarah now is slapping paint all over the music. It's a lot of fun. It's rather nice that the computer cleans up all the mess so that you don't have to worry about <laughs> those normal problems when you're slapping paint over things. Each of those different paint pots represents a different musical timbre. And the note that's displayed on the screen with that color corresponds, is played then by the computer with the timbre that corresponds to the colour. Now let's hear the whole orchestrated piece by putting some paint on the loudspeaker. Notice the vibrato on the last note there. Now, Jeremy is sloshing paint all over the picture now. It looks pretty awful and I don't think it sounds the way he wants. So to get rid of that paint now, all he does is to put the paintbrush back into the paint pot and you'll see that all the Orange colored paints will be restored to the colors that they were before they were painted orange. Isn't that a handy way of undoing your, your painting mistakes? Now to get back to the other games, we now point to the arrow at the bottom left hand corner of the screen, which will take us now back to the green and white screen. Now on this screen over here, we've got the same picture displayed as was on the color screen. Only now, instead of having paint pots displayed around the music, we've got some rather interesting looking shapes. Now, as you can see, these shapes have got two parts each. The bottom part corresponds to the amplitude or the loudness of the note as it changes over time. Here this goes boing, oing, oing, oing. And this corresponds to the richness. There's the overtone sorry, the fundamental, and then there are the successive overtones, and you can see that there are no high harmonics, and there's lots of overtone. Now, let's have a look inside this note, this timbre here, uh, and, uh, and we'll see if we can change it. Now, at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to do an Alice in Wonderland, Now on this screen, 
we are actually inside the, the note. This is the most detailed version of the game. Over here on the screen, we can see the, the relative strengths of the different harmonics. This is the fundamental, and by pushing the magic yellow button, I can decrease the fundamental, or I can increase it, or I can make it disappear altogether. All right, now let's, let's add a few harmonics now. And now we've got a rather rich spectrum. Uh, now, with all these overtones present, we end up with a, a waveform that looks very wiggly. Now this waveform consists of the sum of all these different harmonics here in the proportion indicated by the length of the adjacent bar. For example, there's quite a bit of, of the uh, fundamental, a little bit less of first harmonic, and it decreases until we get to the seventh harmonic. There's the number seven. And then it increases again until we get up to the sixteenth harmonic. So now if we want to hear what this timbre sounds like at different pitches, we can point to different notes. Now that sounds rather raspy and unpleasant. Let's listen to that note down there. It doesn't sound nearly as raspy. It's still got quite an edge to it. Let's, let's listen to that a little bit louder now. I'm pointing to the volume control here, and I can also make it softer as well. Now, uh, let's get rid of some of these harmonics. In fact, what I'd like to do is to make something that sounds vaguely like a clarinet. And I happen to know that the overtone structure of a clarinet has got a large number of odd numbered partials. So what I'm going to do is, let's listen to this note. Now, to me, that needs a few more extra high harmonics to make it sound like a bit more like a bass clarinet. Let's turn that up a bit louder. Now, at this point, having put together the overtones in the way we want, let's now listen to the sound. Now, as you can hear, we've got a note playing with this amplitude envelope. Now, what I'd like to do is to change the amplitude envelope of this note. Now, notice that as I move it around, it doesn't make sense for it to move out of the picture, nor does it make sense for it to move to the left. So, okay. Now, what I'll do now is push a button on the cursor which changes this to a default envelope, which will just be a simple attack and decay. I'll make the note shorter again. Let's change the attack and decay a little bit and go back having made this sound, which sounds rather like a clarinet, a bass clarinet, and we'll go back now to the game that we've just come from to timbre painting. And that was the green colour, if you recall. Now, we've arrived back at the game that we've just left a moment ago, the game with the painting in it. Now, what I'd like to do is demonstrate that the tone that we've just made, that's the green color, the, green, the color that came from the top left-hand corner, as you can see, it's now sitting in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Notice that there is the envelope that we've just made, and there 
are the odd numbered overtones with a little bit of high harmonic up there. Um, and now what we'll do is, uh, what I'd like to do next is to just highlight some of the bass line here. Now the way we do that is we circle the notes that we want to highlight and if we want to make them louder we just stroke stroke the slider. Now let's make the last note quiet. To do that we just circle it and we'll stroke that more quietly. Notice how this has got thinner and this has got a little bit thicker. Now if we want to preserve the relative loudness of the notes we can use, use the slider on the left and then what happens is their relative loudnesses are maintained. Now, at this point, why don't we hear what it sounds like and you'll notice that the green colored notes are now orchestrated with the same sound that we just produced a moment ago. Notice that so far we have used attributes in the visual domain to represent parameters in the acoustic domain. In particular, we've used the thickness of a note to represent loudness, we've used the length of a note to represent duration, and we've used the position on the stave to indicate pitch. And notice here that, that B flat is displayed a little bit lower than B. So that we have in fact dispensed with all those things like sharps, flats, quarter notes, eight notes, and, uh, and loudness, uh, Italian loudness words like forte and piano. What I'd like to do now is to go back to the first game. Here we are back in Music Doodles, and if we wanted to, we could draw more shapes over this. We could remove things that we didn't want. Or alternatively, we could go back to boxes again And here we are, Alice in Wonderland has drunk the bottle labeled Drink Me and she's expanded and as she, as she grows, the universe shrinks. And now here we are back in our boxes environment where we first started. And it was Pop Goes the Weasel that was in this box, the start of Pop Goes the Weasel. And notice how up on the screen we've got the box that we've just created and in actual fact whatever music that we had up here the boxes that we've just made, the box that we've just made would have replaced every instance of the original box in the first game and now to hear what our box is <laughs> And now we can continue playing in this boxes game, assembling pieces of music that we've composed in the other games that we've orchestrated using color and with the orchestral sounds that we've invented using the Sound Factory game. And we can assemble those fragments, those musical fragments on a large scale viewpoint uh, in an overview game in this boxes game. You may have noticed in these games that there has been no use made of the typewriter. Now this is something rather revolutionary, that everything has been done by pointing, by stroking, or by gesture. In fact, it's quite possible to compose an entire piece of music just with one finger. And in fact, that rather curious property has meant that these games are also available not only to children, but to the handicapped. And we've had three quadriplegics come in here, and we've designed a special puck for them so that by using this puck, they are able to make shapes and point, just as you saw me do a moment ago, and the children doing, 
and they are now able to express themselves using this ri rich creative medium of the games. Now, I'd just like to mention a few things about the design of the games because I think it's very important that we realize that these games are not just games that are fixed in time, but they are prototypes. What I mean by that is that each of these games has been assembled from components that have been built up during the design of the games. For example, the very first game that we put together took quite a long time. It took only half that time to make the next game and a quarter of that time to make the third game. And the reason that that, that happened was that certain things like the shrinking and growing we can use from one game to the next. Also, the ability to stroke, the ability to circle, and the ability to slide things up and down on the screen to change the loudness, to change the relative strength of the amplitudes of the harmonics, and the ability to play with part of the screen to control the envelope and have it react in a way that teaches us what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Now, notice as, uh, as well as those modular features of the design that allow us to create new games using the, the exciting features of the old games, there are other important things. First of all, incredibly importantly, I think, there is nothing in these games which says, tough, you've made a mistake. When you play, everything you do has a response. The worst thing that you can happen is that you get a question mark on the screen, or if you do something you don't want to do, there's always a button labeled undo to enable you to get back to where you were. Now, what that means is that a child can explore with the games without being inhibited, without having to worry about making mistakes, because there aren't any to make, and without having to worry about typing. 